Hey everyone, this is Ken Klippenstein uh, with Breaking Points Intercept Edition. I'm joined now by Raid Girar. Uh, he's the Advocacy Director of Democracy in the Arab World Now, or DAWN for short. Um, the reason I have you on is because I really appreciate the work that DAWN does. They provide a useful counterpoint to the um, hegemony of the uh, think tanks here in Washington that tell <laughs> a very particular point of view with regard to the Middle East. And I don't think um, that's a very honest one. I mean, if you look at, uh, and we'll be talking about President Biden's visit to Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. which in itself is a form of normalization with that country. Um, the way in which the media covered that, I saw a ridiculous story in The Atlantic saying that um, Jamal Khashoggi would forgive MBS if given the chance. And I Googled um, The Atlantic's funding and I quickly found that they received large sums of money from a company that itself receives large sums of money from the Saudis. And that, unfortunately, is a dynamic that's true across the board a lot of the, with a lot of the think tanks. That's not the case with Don. They tell a very different picture, I think, a more accurate one. Um, so first of all, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. And so a theme that I wanted to focus on was um, not just that President Biden's visit to Saudi Arabia you know, was, was wrong in a moral sense, but also how humiliating it was for him and for the United States internationally. Just to give you a couple of, of examples, he touches down um, Biden and his entourage, mm -hmm. and they are uh, greeted by a provincial governor first, <laughs> not even by a head of state or anybody in, in MBS's cabinet. And, um, you know, in, in diplomatic circles, that's widely understood to be a uh, kind of slap in the face. Mm -hmm. And not only that, um, once they ended up meeting, he wasn't greeted by the king when he came out of the car, which has diplomatic significance as well. And then um, when they ended up speaking, almost immediately after the bilateral meeting, the Saudis start leaking things, saying, mm -hmm. Uh, that Biden didn't bring up Khashoggi, Biden disputes that. Um, and then subsequent to that, within 24 hours of Biden's leaving the UAE, a country he visited after that, the UAE arrests Jamal Khashoggi's former lawyer, which again, morally wrong, but in addition to that, humiliating in an international sense. I can't think of any other country that would do something like that to the leader of the United States. So could you speak to that a little bit um, from your knowledge of the region and, and what this all means? And also, crucially for Americans, what did we get out of this, mm -hmm. out of this visit? Because again, you know, there's morality and there's also interests, and it's not clear to me that the US got anything out of it. I agree with your assessment. I think it was the worst of both worlds. Uh, it was the worst of both worlds in, in the sense that on the one hand, the Biden administration lost its moral cap capital uh, and uh, moral standing. So, uh, you know, President Biden promised he will center human rights in our foreign policy. He's going to do this. He's going to do that. And the mere fact that he was willing to meet with uh, someone like Mohammed bin Salman and other uh, dictators and apartheid regimes in the region uh, in a way that is completely um, empty of any moral standards by itself made him lose that truck. And the other truck, like the truck of being uh, a pragmatist, the real politique truck, where we're told many times by this administration and other administration that we are naive and we don't understand how the real world works and we have to do some concessions to get some stuff out of it. What did we get out of this? Nothing. We got nothing out of it. And, and when you look at the, the trip, whether it's the part where uh, President Biden goes to Israel or whether it's a part that President Biden goes to uh, Saudi Arabia, it is another classic example of the status quo of how Washington uh, runs on autopilot, that we do things because we do the, these things. Uh, we repeat the same policies because they've been there for decades, uh, completely with no political analysis, with no vision. And there is nothing that came out of it. Like right. even the claim about oil that, oh, we have to go because we need some oil to be pumped out. This is Nothing the, happens. This is a pretext for looking the other way on all these human rights abuses. Khashoggi is an emblem of that, but there are countless people that you know are jailed on um, dubious pretexts. They don't really have a rule of law in terms of you know, being able to represent yourself in court. Um, countless activists, uh, not just jailed, in some cases killed. Um, so it's much bigger than, you know, Khashoggi is an emblem of all of that. And so we're sort of told by the, you know, quote unquote adults in the room that we've got to be grown ups here and, you know, things, uh, you know, you have to break some eggs to, to have an empire and to get the oil and <laughs> critical resources that we need. 
Um, you know, within days of Biden visiting uh, Saudi Arabia, their foreign minister is making statements saying we're unable to increase the oil production. Mm -hmm. So that's out the window. Mm -hmm. And I start looking very closely thinking, okay, what could conceivably even be the concession that they're getting out of this? The only thing I could find was um, uh, permission for Israeli commercial flights to fly over Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's the only thing that I could find. So, yeah, and and uh, why, why is that in the United States interest? Like, I don't think exactly. that's, that's a concession that the US to government, Israel. Yeah, yeah, I mean, like, it's not like we're not getting anything out right. of this. And we're not, uh, we're not an agent for a, a third country to go promote their interests. Like, I think one would expect that the president of the United States will put the US interests first. Yeah. And we've been asking uh, the same question. Like, we have our, um, you know, moral arguments and um, ethical arguments about why, uh, as the organization that was founded by the late Jamal Khashoggi, why President Biden should not engage with MBS or with the Saudi government. But we also have the real pol politique argument of what are you getting out of this relationship? That's what struck me in researching all of this, is initially I thought it was something, you know, I thought it was primarily a human rights thing, but that's absolutely not true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, at first glance, you could see, okay, a very oil-rich dictatorship, you know, um, the, the, the kind of supposition here is, okay, well, you've got to make deals with them in order to get that oil. But oil production has been, um, you know, not sufficient to the needs, particularly after the war with Russia, uh, in, in which they've been sanctioned and their oil has taken off the market. Gas prices are, you know, through the roof right now, and that's having very serious effects, um, not just with respect to filling up your car, but oil is factored into everything that we buy because that determines the price of international shipping. That's, right. That's how things are manufactured. So, you know, politically, this is putting Biden in a very difficult um, uh, position. I would imagine that that factors into his low approval rating. And again, how none of that has changed. The, those rates of production haven't changed. Mm -hmm. There hasn't been any plans. I mean, Saudi hasn't made any statements saying we're going to try to ramp up production in the medium term even. There doesn't seem, so So that sort of assumption that, oh yeah, you got to look the other way, oil. I just haven't seen that to, to bear any, to carry any water. Yeah, that's right. And, I mean, there is a point that you touched on earlier regarding U.S. citizens in the region. Uh, there are yeah talk about that a bit and, right. and the u.s prisoners in saudi right. jails did was he able what did biden did biden bring that up or was he able to get them he released? did not and before his visit there were multiple letters sent by family members and uh, and human rights organizations asking the biden administration to uh, bring up issues pertaining to u.s citizens and you know this is like a a no-brainer. You would think that a U.S. A US an American citizen, citizen, our government yeah, is supposed that, to... That our government will actually say something right. about them. So in Israel, there was a recent killing of a, a Palestinian-American journalist. Very famous journalist. Very famous journalist, not... Shirin Abu Akla. She was killed by uh, Israel with absolutely no accountability. There were calls for the president to at least mention her name or meet with her family while he's there. Nothing. Not a single, even like empty gesture of calling for accountability for a U.S. citizen, yeah. or uh, requesting an investigation into how U.S. weapons might have contributed to this violation. Nothing. That's the other thing I want to talk about, is how much leverage we have over countries. That's right. Because people love to say things like, um, you know, we're, you know, they've got us over a barrel, what can we do with the oil? They don't have much in the way of an indigenous military. They depend on us for not just um, the weapon systems, but the maintenance of those systems. People don't understand how complex having an F-16 is and, you know, changing parts, teaching them how to use software, things like that. That's right. We have so much leverage over a country. We like do, and, and that's also like one of the questions that is put out there uh, as a deflection point. Uh, you know, what about Iran? What about Hamas? Uh, what about, it's like, you know, we don't sell Iran hundreds right. of what billions of dollars of, of weapons. Country that's an enemy. Yeah, yeah, we don't give, you know, Hamas billions of dollars of military aid every year. Like we have actual leverage over Israel and Saudi Arabia and the UAE and, and Egypt because we give them billions of dollars of tax dollars money every year. We sell them hundreds of billions of dollars worth of weapons. And you were saying, it's not like weapons are not like vegetables. It's not like they can just go buy a, a Chinese right. uh, jet fighter right. instead they don't of an F-16. <laughs> the U.S. is the best at this stuff. And not only that, like once you have a system, you're stuck with it. Like yeah. you need like a generation yeah, to switch. I, you I know? was talking to an intelligence officer and I asked him, I said, you know, all this fear mongering that you see from the think tanks that I was mentioning before saying, oh, if we don't give the Saudis whatever we want, who knows, maybe they could turn to the Chinese or we'll drive them in the arms of the Russians. I asked this guy who knows a lot about weapon systems and had worked in the region for a number of years. I said, how long would it take to switch systems? And he 
said there's actually been intelligence assessments on this, uh, which hold that it would take at least a decade mm -hmm. in, a, in, a, in a regime like that, deeply unpopular, corrupt, uh, you know, hated by many in the region, um, illegitimate, it's a literal monarchy. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have to say that they're probably gonna be concerned about having the military equipment that they need to be able to stay in power because they're not in power by the consent of the governed. It's not like they're popular. That's right, so, so the, your point stands that we do have, as a country, we have uh, huge amounts of leverage over these, these countries and we're not using it. Uh, right. So uh, the other um, demand from families of US citizens uh, was to uh, speak up about um, U.S. citizens who are imprisoned in the UAE and in, uh, in Saudi Arabia. Not a single word. Not a meeting with civil society organizations. Not a demand. Not even an empty gesture regarding these kind of issues. And like honestly, like even regardless of the human rights violations and that angle, using that as an important political pressure point would have been more productive for the president. So, it, so that's why I was saying it's right, the worst of both worlds right. because he didn't do the right things for the right reasons, but he didn't do the right things for the wrong reasons <laughs> either, either, you know? Yeah. <laughs> he, it's crazy because when you look at the kind of leverage that we have in the, in the form of the um, armed support that we sell them, and this is in the hundreds of billions, like huge sums of money. Um, what's wonderful about that is unlike with our other adversaries like Iran or China, we don't have to risk going to war with them. All you have to do is it's, you don't even really have to do something in, in a positive sense. You just have to stop that flow, just suspend it for a little while, and that would send a clear message. The U.S. has done that to countries in the past. Um, and what's wonderful about that is it's such a conservative solution that doesn't put us on the hook for you know open-ended wars or occupations. Just stop even just some of the support, and that would send a clear message to the people in Riyadh, I think. Yeah, that's 100% 100 right. And like I think many of our organizations in D.C. have been saying the same, which is, you don't have to use a sledgehammer uh, policy with, with right. um, aid. Like you can suspend parts of aid right. to Egypt or to Israel uh, or uh, make some conditions. Even just, we're not even getting the symbolic. No, not even the symbolic, you not, know? Even like, not even like 1%, right. you know, like, like, like not even like a symbolic message that we do have control over our resources. We do have control over, over aid, not even symbolically. So we're stuck in this complete blank check autopilot check, policies, yeah. uh, and uh, countries like Israel or, or Saudi Arabia, they don't even worry about the flow of arms yeah. and the flow of weapons because it's just on, on autopilot. Right, so can you speak to, um, you're a modest guy, you won't admit this, but you're very well connected in, on the Hill and in Washington, you know a lot of officials. Do you have a sense of why is this? Because we're looking at it and um, is it just the, the, the strength of these uh, you know, foreign lobby groups and, and the think tanks and everything, because uh, there has to be something Biden is getting out of this, even just for himself. What, why do you think this persists, this state of affairs? I mean, I, I don't think there is one one answer to that question. Mm -hmm. It's a very complex question. It's it's a question, the, que the real question is, why is there a status quo force in Washington, D.C.? Whether it's Biden or Trump or Obama or Bush, like we saw some of these policies be identical. Yeah. Uh, and whatever the president said before they came to office, during or, uh, or after. I should remind everyone, Biden said that he was gonna make Saudi Arabia a quote pariah. That's right. Which is a word that doesn't leave a lot of room for interpretation. That's, that's right. pretty, It's pretty strong language, you know? That's right. And then you end up looking at the policy and it's remarkably similar to, you know, not just Trump, but every predecessor there's been. Yeah, I mean, like, I mean, like it's, so it is like an all the above approach uh, for keeping the status quo in DC. You have yeah. the very powerful lobbyists for the, like the you know military industrial complex uh, special yeah. interests Saudi Arabia pumps you know hundreds of millions of dollars in in lobbying for every administration uh, there are special interest groups in DC like there are like election politics and you know congressional corruption and it right. all works together you right. know like like one example that I always give to um, outsiders of DC just to explain how complicated it is mm -hmm. to change the status quo is that there's this um, very small airplane, uh, like A-10, that the Pentagon wanted to cut out. So the Pentagon itself, the DOD said, we don't really need this airplane anymore. And Congress said, yeah, if the Pentagon doesn't need it, let's cut it out. Then the military industrial complex pushes so hard, this airplane, which is as big as a, as a bus, it's very, very small. Uh, it's manufactured in all 50 states. There you go. So, so then, it's like one state makes the door, one state makes the wheel, one state makes the engine. 
So you get phone calls from all 50 states to senator offices, freaking out about jobs, freaking out about like a change of uh, policies, and then you keep an airplane that the Pentagon doesn't need, that Congress yeah. doesn't want to push, that we're paying for. So this, this is like a very yeah, tiny example yeah. that actually, like no one is going out there fighting against the A-10, you know? Right. The Pentagon doesn't need it, right. you know? It's just like a very non-controversial issue. Just the issue. inertia <laughs> of this system that they've set up, and the Saudis have a very aggressive lobby. Imagine like how process. it works for Saudi Arabia or Israel. Like, um, like Saudi With Arabia and Israel have, money. have yeah. like amazing amounts of influence and power in D.C. Like imagine the, the, the power that they can put, uh, the push to, on Congress and on the administration and the State Department to keep the status quo. It's, it's really very, very difficult to change. Okay, well, Wright, I really want to thank you for joining us, and uh, thanks to our viewers for joining us for the uh, Breaking Points Intercept edition. Cable news is ripping us apart, dividing the country, making it impossible to function as a society, and making it impossible to know just what is true and what is false. But the good news is they are failing and they know it. That is why we're building something new, a new mainstream, a healthier one, something more trustworthy, something that we are going to need in one of the most pivotal times in American history. We are building up here for the midterms, for the upcoming presidential election, but we need your help. So if you can help us out by becoming a premium member today at breakingpoints.com, we're trying to change America for the better and the entire world. So what are you waiting for, guys? Go to breakingpoints.com and sign up and help us build a new mainstream.